All right. Um, my name is James Fowler, and I study social networks. And every time I have a conversation with someone on a plane about what I study, they think, you must know Mark Zuckerberg. Well, that's not actually the kind of social networks that I study. I study social networks like these. These are the real-world social networks that we've had ever since we were huddled around campfires on the Serengeti. We, as a species, have friends. Other species, they have social relationships with people with other uh, individuals that they are uh, connected to via uh, a mating relationship or via family, a genetic relationship. But humans are sort of unique in that we form relationships people are not related to and we're not reproducing with. We have friends, and these friends are extremely powerful in everything that we do. And I'm really excited about a lot of the research that we've done on social networks. I'd love to share some of it with you today. Um, one of the things I want to do first, though, is I want to put you into a place where you're thinking about the same kind of thing that we're thinking about when we think of real-world social networks. And we do that typically by asking people to name their friends. So think for yourself. Who are your friends? You might think that that's kind of a strange question to ask because, you know, people think about different kinds of people when they think of their friends. And so we actually make it a little more specific, usually by asking a couple of different kinds of questions like, who do you discuss important matters with, and who do you spend your free time with? Most people in many cultures will name, on average, somewhere between a couple up to five or ten people whenever we ask them the answers to these questions, to name who their friends are. Um, so these are the people that I'm talking about, not your thousands of Twitter followers, not all the people you know on Instagram or, or on, on Facebook. Um, these are your real-world world friends. And I think it's really important if we want to understand this new context of social media online, we first have to start with these real-world social networks. And when you think about each one of the friends that you have, you can start an analysis in a very simple way. There's just you and one other person. There's a pair. And that's very simple. You can sort of think about you and that person and the relationship that, that you have with that person. You can be a friend. You can be a family member. You have lots of different ways you can be connected to that person. But there's another way that you can start to analyze this, which is to put those different pairs together into many pairs. Because just as you are connected to a friend, your friend is also connected to people who you are not necessarily friends with. So these are your friends of friends. And as a consequence, you actually are connected to those people as well. In fact, you are interconnected to hundreds and thousands and actually billions of people on the planet. And so as a consequence, if we want to understand how we are behaving as a species and how human beings interact with one another, I think we really need to understand social networks as a whole. Um, we started doing this by, first of all, looking at uh, how health effects spread in large social networks. I had the good fortune of forming a, my own social network with uh, uh, Professor Nicholas Christakis. Um, he and I worked together uh, with the Framingham Heart Study, this long-running study that started in the 1950s, where they've been keeping meticulous records on their health and well-being. They haven't come in for exams every two to four years, and we know things, for example, how much do they weigh? Well, we were able to go to that study and look at paper records to try to identify the real-world social connections, because every time they came in, they not only got in a scale and saw the doctor and filled out health questionnaires, they, they also told researchers who their friends were so that the researchers could find them again in two to four years to have them come back to the study. When we mapped those social networks, we found something truly extraordinary. We found that there were clusters of behavior that extended beyond our social horizon. Now, you may have an awareness that your health behaviors influence people that you can see. So if you eat more, you might notice that your friends eat more as well. But there are people that you can't see that might be influenced as well. And we found some preliminary evidence for that in the, the graph that I'm showing you now. Each one of the, the circles in this graph is a person. Each line is a, is a social relationship. And we actually colored the circles yellow for people who were suffering from obesity. And we found clusters of obesity that extended out to three degrees of separation. What I mean by that is if, if a person is obese, it also means that their friends are more likely to be obese, their friends of friends are more likely to be obese, and their friends of friends of friends. If I don't know anything about you, but I know that your friend's friend's friend is obese, then I can do better than chance by predicting that you yourself are obese as well. Now, that in and of itself is not necessarily indicative of a spreading process. 
there might not be anything to that because it's, there's several different things that can cause that kind of clustering in a social network. One of them is influence where one domino falls and then the next and then the next. You start eating more, your friend starts eating more, their friend starts eating more. Or you start exercising more and your weight goes down and your friend also starts exercising more and their weight goes down and so on. But there's also a thing called homophily, um, which is literally birds of a feather flock together. Sometimes we choose friends who are similar to us. Um, skinny people may be prejudiced against overweight people, and they may choose other skinny people as friends. Skinny people may be skinny because they like working out, and they go to the gym where they make friends with other people who go to the gym and who also work out. So if that's the case, it's not the case that my health behavior is influencing you. It's that the people that I'm socially connected to are people I chose who share attributes with me that also are correlated with whether or not they're obese. And so in order to try to figure out whether or not influence is happening in these networks, um, it's also important to, to take that into account. Another thing that's, that could create a problem for inference in these networks though, is, is context. It could be that you and your friend both live near a gym that just opened up and independently each of you start going to classes, not together, you go to separate classes, you don't even know your friend is going to the class and your weight will go down at the same time because you are both exposed by this third thing in the environment that's going to make it look like you might have an influence on your friend but really both of you are influenced by a third thing. And so it's important to control for those things whenever you're trying to figure out whether or not there's influence threading in this network. Now, we were able to do that in the Framingham Heart Study in a couple of ways that were new at the time. One of them is we were able to use information about who named who as a friend to be able to differentiate what direction the influence is flowing. So if I name you as a friend, I am thinking of you, I esteem you, you are going to be influencing me. If you don't name me back, you don't think about me, you're not paying attention to me, you're probably less influenced by me. And what we found was that if I name you as a friend and you become obese, it increases the likelihood that I'll be obese in the next two to four years by about 57%. But if you reverse the direction, we didn't find any significant relationship. Um, in other words, if you were named as a friend by somebody and they don't name you back, that person is not going to be very uh, influential in, in your life. And in fact, we found another thing that sort of indicated that that this might be a, an influence process, and that is mutual friends. People name each other had the strongest influence on one another. So the stronger the, the social tie, the stronger the relationship. Another thing we were able to do is we were able to look at context in a unique way. We had the addresses of all the people in the neighborhood, and what we found was that if your neighbor becomes obese, there's no relationship with, with your own obesity. It doesn't predict whether you'll go um, higher or lower in, in, in your weight over time. Um, and so this was suggestive, even though it wasn't an experiment, it was suggestive of an influence process that spreads through these networks. And we did a number of other studies besides the obesity study. We did one on smoking, and we found, again, if your friend's friend's friend smokes, then I can do better than chance by predicting that you smoke as well. And in fact, one of the things we found in this study was that smokers were actually getting pushed to the outside of those social networks as smoking became less popular from the 1970s through the, through the 2000s. We did a study on drinking behavior, and here again, if your friend's friend's friend drinks heavily, you're more likely to drink heavily. But an interesting thing in that study was that we found that although men are the ones who typically drink more heavily, women are the ones who are more influential. If the woman stops drinking, everyone pays attention to her. If a man stops drinking, everyone ignores him. Um, and so one of the things that, that's really interesting about that study is you can differentiate who's actually driving these influence effects. Um, we looked at happiness. Happiness spreads in a, in a way that, that you would imagine is sort of intuitive. You know, if I'm walking down the street and I see someone smile, um, I can't help but smile back. Um, and we saw clusters of happiness in the Framingham Heart Study, long-term happiness that extend, also extended out to three degrees of separation. And one of the interesting things about emotions compared to behaviors is when you change a behavior, it tends to persist over time. When you change an emotion, you tend to go back to your original state. And this is one of the things that we saw in the study was that when your friend becomes happy, it influences you, but only for about a year. After about a year, your friend's happiness isn't really relevant to, to, to your happiness in the future anymore. And so it's like uh, the researchers, they talk about this hedonic treadmill. It's like if you want to be happy, you have to go a couple steps forward, um, but then it keeps pushing you back to your, your basic state. Um, so we've looked at... at, at a lot of different things in this, this famous Framingham Heart Study. We've also done experiments on generosity in the laboratory. 
where we give people an opportunity to give money in a generosity game. Um, and when they play with other people who are more generous, they themselves are more generous. And in fact, when I play with someone who's more generous and then I go and play with a new group of people, I continue being more generous and the people that I play with become more generous and then the people that they play with become more generous. In other words, here in this laboratory experiment, we found this three degrees of separation rule once again, that your friends, friends, friends tend to do what you do. The more you give, the more your friends, friends, friends will give. And in fact, the effect is so strong that we found that every extra dollar of giving in this game caused the network as a whole to give an extra $3 overall. In other words, the network acts like a matching grant. And so these networks are incredibly powerful. And we continue to find that it's true not just in modern life, but in, in our, our biological and evolutionary life as well. We conducted a study with the Hadza in, in uh, northern Tanzania, this, this group of, of people that still are hunter-gatherers, the way all of us were uh, thousands and thousands of years ago. Um, and we mapped their social networks, and we looked at about 10 different ways that you can measure social networks, and they all looked almost identical to modernized networks, which suggests that these, these network structures have a very, very old heritage. We also found clusters of similar behavior that looked very much like those that we saw in the Framingham Heart Study. We've conducted genetic studies. We looked at identical twins and found that their networks tend to be more similar than the, the networks of non-identical twins. And we were able to actually estimate the heritability of some of these social network characteristics and found them to be quite heritable. That there's, there's different things that you're born with, different physiology, different uh, things going on in your brain that are a consequence of, of your genetic footprint that contribute to the structure of your social networks. So this is something that that we, this is an area where really the, the social sciences and the natural sciences can really come together. To really understand human beings, you need not just uh, to understand you know, sociology and economics and history, you need to understand genetics and biology and, and evolutionary sciences as well. So this is all just a prelude. Remember, like at the beginning, you know, I was saying, you know, I study social networks, and everyone these days, they think of social media, and they think of social networks. And so how do we take those natural social networks online? That's a really big question for us now. Um, and one of the things I want to emphasize is that these online social networks are very different in a specific way. So I'm going to show you a graph of a, a network that we mapped of real-world face-to-face ties of some college students. Um, and uh, you can see that it looks like all these other graphs I've been showing you, like it's, it's very sparse. People tend to have just a few real-world friends. But then we also had their Facebook friendships. And when you look at that picture, it's a big ball of spaghetti. Everyone is connected to everyone else. It's kind of crazy. And so how do you sort all that out? Um, one of the things that we first realized is that when you try to look for this friend-to-friend -friend effect in a Facebook network, if you look at all the connections, you don't find anything. There's nothing about you that's correlated with your average Facebook friend. So what we have to do is we have to find the real world friends on Facebook. And we can do that by looking at things like photo tagging. You're much more likely to photo tag someone who is a real world friend. And when you do that, you reduce by an order of magnitude the number of people that, 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 that you are connected to on Facebook. Because you may be uh, friends with hundreds of people on Facebook, but you probably only, only photo tag or are photo tagged by uh, a dozen or maybe a couple of dozen, dozen of people. And when we started looking at those kinds of relationships and doing maps like this one, we found uh, clustering of behaviors that you can measure on Facebook, like whether or not you're smiling or not smiling in your profile picture. If your friend's friend is smiling in the profile picture, you're more likely to be smiling in your profile picture as well. Um, this was also true of obesity clusters. Once again, we were able to take the photos and classify people's weight status, and we found clusters of overweight women and clusters of overweight men that extended out to two degrees of separation. And so the, our real-world networks, they're online. They're there. Um, and so you have this new context where we're connected to so many different people, but it's the real-world networks that seem to still be driving our behavior. Um, we tested this at scale with a very, very large experiment. At the time, it was possibly the largest ex experiment ever conducted with 61 million people on Facebook in the 2010 uh, US, presidential, uh, U.S. congressional election. Um, and we did this by showing some people uh, a message that today is election day and go and vote. And some other people, we didn't show that message to. Now, we had a lot of different things we were doing with this message. We were testing to see whether or not people would go and find their polling place if they saw this message. We were testing whether or not they would share information about voting with their friends by clicking an I voted button. 
But even more importantly, what we did was we matched uh, 6 million of those 61 million people to publicly available voter registration records to see whether or not the message actually mattered. And what we found was that the direct effect of this message, if you saw this message, you were actually a little more likely to vote. In fact, we estimate that this message got about 60,000 more people to vote in the 2010 election. These are real votes. People got off the couch and went to the polls. But even more important than that, the friends of people who saw that message were also more likely to vote. And the probability of voting, given that your friend has seen the message, is very, very small. But don't forget, there are a lot of friends there. We had to restrict the analysis to just people who are likely to be close friends in real life. But even when we did that, we found that the total number of people who were motivated to vote by their friends seeing the message was about 240,000. And so you have this total effect um, that is almost completely driven, not by the, the direct effect, but by the indirect effect. And no one has been measuring this. And we've been doing all these interventions over the course of you know, the last century, really, trying to get people to buy things, to change the health behavior. And when you just measure the direct effect of them, you're missing the full story is what, what this, this data really, really suggests. So let me conclude with some, some thoughts about what this all means. One of the things that happens when you start studying these social networks and you realize how powerful they are, is you ask yourself the question, am I in control of my own decision making? Um, it's interesting because when people covered the obesity uh, paper when it came out, reporters in the United States, um, their headlines were, uh, your friends are making you fat. In Europe, the headlines were, you are making your friends fat. Which is interesting because there are different cultural approaches to this question of free will. To what extent is this influence effect causing you to maybe have an idea that you really don't have any agency? Like this guy in this cartoon, like he's just going to give up. Um, he's not going to take any responsibility over his own behavior. And I want to say that that's the wrong message to take from this. Because while these effects are very powerful, we're not saying that there's no room for individuals. And in fact, if anything, you might think that social networks make us more powerful because we're influencing the uh, outcomes, not just for ourselves, but for our friends as well. So number one, don't dump your friends. Some people take uh, from the obesity study this idea that if you have someone who's influencing you negatively, you should um, get, get rid of them. We went back to the Framingham Heart Study to see whether or not that was the case. We looked at all the people who dumped a friend and all the people who kept a friend in the study and compared their weight outcomes. And what we found was that the people who dumped their friends were the ones who actually became even more obese. You have two different things going on. You're influenced by your friends, but you also get benefits from each friend that you have. And so it's very important not to get rid of your friends just because they're doing something that is potentially mildly influencing you in a, in a negative way. Um, the other thing that I think that is really important is that you need to get your friends involved. Um, there's this great cartoon by Kathy that came out in response to the obesity study where the women realize that they're not going to dump each other, that they're actually going to help each other by ordering for each other. In the final frame of this cartoon, um, you see that Kathy and her friends, they're all saying, well, she'll have a salad. Because if you can get your friends to do healthy things, it feeds back and has an influence on, on you as well. And the last thing I'll just say is that each of us needs to realize our own network power. Um, just like this, this young man in this movie, Pay It Forward, who realized that if he conducted just one experiment, uh, and that experiment is to product, practice a random act of kindness and ask nothing in return other than that that person pay it forward to three other people, then three becomes nine, becomes 27, becomes a revolution. If each of us realize that everything we do affects not just us, but 27 other people, just think how much different the world would be. This is why I think it's so important for us to understand why social networks influence as a human being and to really understand what's at the root of why and how each of us is connected. Thank you very much.